Thanks to everyone for tuning in to the Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church of Memphis Incorporated YouTube channel for another worship experience. I uh, wish above all things that you are prospering and in good health, even as your soul prospered. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, our in, in our individual places, we come to praise you for the victory that Jesus provided for us on Calvary. We pray for expository listening ears to hear your voice as though you're speaking directly to us through your word, uh, that we might glorify you by obeying whatever you say to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, we are going to do a little spot reading of Luke chapter 23, verse 26 through 43, the English Standard Version I'll be reading uh, for timeliness. Uh, we'll read a few verses here and then skip a few and then read a few more. Uh, verse 26 of Luke chapter 23 uh, reads, And as they led him away, they seized one Simon of Cyrene who was coming in from the country and laid on him the cross to carry behind Jesus. And they there followed him a great multitude of the people and of women who were mourning and grieving for him. Now let's skip down to verse 32. Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called, called the skull, they were crucified with him. And the criminals, one on his right side and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Uh, and they cast lots to divide his garments. Now let's skip down to verse 42. Verse 42 says, and he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Now, we, we're going to go directly to an expose of the text that gives us four groups to investigate. And uh, before I give you the four groups, I'm going to talk today about the victory on Calvary. The victory on Calvary. If you remember last week, we talked about the agony of defeat. If you, you might recall, uh, a TV show used to come on Saturday evening uh, titled uh, uh, The Wild World of Sports. And they were talking about the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. So that idea while reading our text uh, came to mind. And last week we covered the agony of defeat or the agony of, of uh, uh, Gethsemane. And this week we're dealing with the victory of the cross. Now, the four groups that we're going to look at is, first of all, Jesus and Simon, Simon of Cyrene. And then the second group is Jesus and the Jerusalem women. And the third group, Jesus and the criminals. The fifth, fourth group is Jesus and the Father. So there's four groups or four points that we're going to look at as we talk about the victory on Calvary. It was a part of the prisoner's humiliation that he carry his own cross to the place of execution. So when Jesus left Pilate's hall, he was carrying uh, his cross. But apparently he was unable to go on for the soldiers had to draft Simon of Serene to carry the cross for him. And when you consider all that Jesus had endured since his arrest in the garden, it, it is not difficult to imagine how falling under uh, the load would be something that would happen. Uh, but there is something more involved. Uh, carrying the cross was a sign of guilt, and our Lord was not guilty. Jesus was our scapegoat, carrying our sins away from us. Jesus uh, is taking our place in essence, just as it's stated in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. I'm reading the New Living Translation. It says, for God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Now, th thousands of Jews came to Jerusalem from other nations to celebrate the feast, and Simon was among them. 
He had traveled over 800 miles from Africa to celebrate the Passover. And now uh, he was being humiliated in a, uh, on a most holy day. What uh, looked to Simon like a catastrophe turned into a wonderful opportunity for it brought him in contact with Jesus. Now, I don't know about you all, but 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 the quickest way for me to come in contact with Jesus is when things are going wrong in my life. Enough of that. We all come to Jesus with unrealized humiliations, but it in reality, Jesus is there to take it from us instead of causing us humiliation. He takes our humiliation. Before Simon met Jesus, he had religion and devotion. But after he met Jesus, he had reality and salvation. He did both a physical and a spiritual about face that morning, and it transformed his life. God can still use unexpected and difficult situations, even humiliating situations, to bring people to the Savior. The second group is Jesus and the Jerusalem women, found basically in uh, chapter Luke chapter 23, verses uh, 27 through 31. In, let's see, public ex execution drew crowds of spectators, and one in, was involving Jesus uh, was especially attractive in attention, an attention getter. Added to this, the fact that Jerusalem was crowded with pilgrims, uh, and it's not difficult to believe that a great multitude was following the condemned man to Calvary. Jesus, as a side note of interest, let me say, the majority of the people were there at Jerusalem for the Passover, but Jesus was there to fulfill the Old Testament Passover ritual by becoming the Lamb of God that came to take away the sins of the world. In this crowd was a group of women who openly wept and moaned as they sympathized with Jesus and contemplated the terrible spiritual conditions of their nation. It had been pointed out that as far as the gospel records are concerned, no woman was ever an enemy of Jesus. His example here, he, he, he's teaching, and most of all, he, he, he's teaching about his redemption, having done much to dignify and elevate women. So, so he's giving a lesson that's still being learned in this day and age that that, that, that instead of, 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 of pushing women to the side, we should follow Jesus' example in elevating women. The news of his birth even was shared by a Jewish maiden. His death was witnessed by grieving women. And the good news of his resurrection was announced first to a woman who had been demon-possessed. Jesus appreciated their sympathy and used it to teach them and, uh, and us an important lesson. They were weeping over the injustice of one man's death. He was looking ahead and grieving over the terrible destruction of the entire nation and a judgment that was wholly justified. You can find more about that in Luke chapter 19, verse 41 through 44. The nation of Israel was like a green tree. During the years when Jesus was on earth, it was a time of blessing and opportunities, and it should have been a time of fruitfulness. But the nation rejected Jesus and became like a dry tree, fit only for firewood. Jesus often would have gathered his people together, but they would not allow him. In condemning Jesus, they were only condemning themselves. 
Now the third group, Jesus and the malefactors or the criminals. Uh, Luke uh, chapter 30, chapter 23, verses 32 through 43 bears this out. First of all, criminals were normally executed, but Jesus came to die for criminals and all the many other sin that sinners had committed. He came not to die on, on, as a normal person being executed, but he came to lay down his life for sinners, lost sinners. He came to lay down his life and or to give his life to pay the price for the sins of the world. Even. That's everybody, criminals and all. God gave his only begotten son for that specific purpose. And what God proposes, he does not change. When it seems like God is changing his mind, uh, it's because he allows his mercy and his grace to change the outcome of our situation. It had been prophesied that the suffering servant that in the book of Mark that was wrote to the Greek, he emphasized uh, that uh, uh, he was Jesus was numbered with the transgressors in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 12 and Luke chapter 22, verse 37. Uh, those verses, Isaiah 53, verse 12 says, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercessions for the transgressors. Luke chapter 22, verse 37 says, for I tell you this, uh, that this scripture must be fulfilled. And he was numbered with the transgressors for what is written about him is about to be fulfilled. And two criminals were crucified with Jesus, men who were robbers. That says Matthew chapter 28, verse 27, rather, verse 38. The Greek word means one who uses violence to rob openly. Now, don't be too quick to condemn them, because probably me and everybody that's listening have robbed God openly. Just take a look at uh, the book of Malachi. Uh, in contrast to the thieves who uh, secretly enters a house to steal. These men that were, were crucified with Jesus, they were accused of being violent, open, you know, what do they call that? Strong on robbery. Now, Jesus was crucified about 9 a.m. and remained on the cross until 3 p.m. And from noon to 3 p.m., there was darkness over all the land. Luke chapter 22, verse 53 says, when I was daily with you in the temple, you stretched uh, forth not your hands against me. But this is your hour, this, this dark time. This is your hour and the power of darkness. In other words, Jesus was submitting to the Father's will by giving in to, to die for our sins, to pay the penalty for our sins. Remember last week, a week before last, Jesus was the only one that was qualified to do that. Because he did not have the, the, the bloodline that had been passed from uh, Adam all the way up to Jesus. He didn't. He, he was tempted in all the ways that we are yet without sin. He had never sinned. Now, one of the downfalls of mankind has been uh, our love for darkness. If you're my age, I'm, I'm, I'm getting on up in my 60s now. If you're my age, you know something about hanging out at nightclubs and, and, and it, in the nighttime being the right time to be, well, you know how the song goes. But you, 
can you imagine somebody walking into a club when you was in there and and and, and, and turning on all of the lights? Mm, mm, mm. So uh, the downfall of mankind has been our love for darkness. John chapter three, verse 19 says, and this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world and men loved darkness rather than the light. Men love darkness rather than the light. That's mankind. Uh, because their deeds were evil. While they were nailing Jesus' hands to the cross, Jesus repeatedly prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus was practicing what he taught especially in Luke chapter 6, verse 27 and 28, that says, But I say unto you, which hear, love your enemies, do good to them who hate you, bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. It was providential that Jesus was crucified between the two thieves. For they gave both, this gave both of them an equal opportunity and equal access to the Savior, Jesus Christ. We in our witnessing opportunities must never forget that everyone, no matter how vile uh, they might be, each has an equal access or an opportunity to, for, to a right to Jesus, our Savior. One recognized and accepted Jesus, and the other chose to remain in his sin. The outlook of the criminals on both sides of Jesus also gives us a look at the danger of following the crowd. One thief mimicked the scorn of the religious leaders and asked Jesus to rescue him from the cross, but the other thief had a different idea. He must have had some reason if, in his thinking, if this man is indeed the Christ and if he has a kingdom and if he has saved others, then he can meet my greatest need, which is salvation from my sin. Perhaps he thought this to himself. I'm not ready to die. It took courage for this thief to defy the influences of his friends and the mockery of the crowd, especially the high priest and, and the elders, all of those that represented uh those that had a relationship with God. And it took faith for him to trust in what seemed to be a dying king. When you consider all that he had to overcome, the faith of this thief is astounding. The man was saved wholly by grace, and that's true for all of us. It was the gift of God, as stated in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, 2 verse 8 and 9 for you are saved by grace through faith not of works lest any man should boast he did not deserve it and he could not earn it his salvation was personal and secure guaranteed by the word of Jesus Christ this man's hope for some kind of help in the future but look at Jesus Jesus gave him forgiveness that very day. And though he died, he went with Jesus to paradise. It should be noted that the people at Calvary fulfilled Old Testament prophecy in which they did by gambling for our Lord's clothing, as stated in Psalms 22, verse 18. They were mocking him, also stated in Psalms chapter 22, verse 6 through 8. And they were offering him vinegar to drink, as uh, stated in Psalms 69 and verse 21. 
God is still on the throne and his word is still in control. What God says will come to pass. The last one, the last group, Jesus and the Father. And we find that in verse 44 through 49. We must keep in mind that what Jesus accomplished on the cross was an eternal transaction that involved him and his father. Jesus cried with a loud voice, it is finished. A declaration of victory. He had finished the work that his father had given him to do in John 17 and 14 that says, I glorified you on the earth having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And verse five says, and now father glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. And one day because of Jesus and what he accomplished because he finished the work on Calvary and paying the penalty for our sins, one day, we will be glorified with our heavenly father the day when Jesus returns. The work of redemption was completed and the prophecies were fulfilled and the savior could now rest. Hebrews 9 and 24 says, for Christ has entered not into a, ho not into a holy place made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into a into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. He then addressed the Father in the final statement from the cross. Father, into thy hand I commend my spirit, I convey my spirit, I place my spirit in your hand. This was actually a bedtime prayer used by Jewish children. And it tells us of our Lord that he died confidently and willingly and victoriously. It reminds me of the first prayer my grandmother taught me in the cotton fields of Mississippi. Now I lay me down to sleep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord, my soul to for those who knew Jesus as their savior and may die with the same confidence and assurance as stated in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 1 through 8 and I'll paraphrase it. For we know that if this tent, this tabernacle, this temporary dwelling place, this temporary body, which is our earthly home, is it destroyed, we have a building from God a house not made with hands, eternal in the heaven. And then another verse of our confidence with when we die as believers is found in Philippians chapter one, verse 20 through 23. And I'll paraphrase that again. It says, for me to live is Christ and for me to die is gain. I, I often refer to that as a win-win situation. We as believers can't lose. Now, when our Lord released his spirit, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. This miracle announced to the priest that people that and, and to people that the way into God's presence was open for all who would come to him by faith through Jesus Christ. And that's why. Every now and then, in the dark hours of my life, you, you'll hear me. If you could hear my heart crying out, my, in my heart, there's a song that says, One glad morning, when this life is over, I'll fly away and be at rest. On that, to a home on God's celestial shore. And just a few more weary days and then I'll fly away to a land where joy will never end. I'll fly away. 
All because Jesus hung, bled, and died on an old rugged cross on a hill called Calvary. He died so that we could have a right to the tree of life. For you and me, he died. But early the third day morning, he rose with all power in heaven and in earth in his hands. And that, my brothers and sisters, is the greatest example of God working a bad situation out for our good instead of us having to die for our sins. Jesus died on Calvary and gives us the victory. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the reminder of the uh, sports event that used to come on TV called the Wild Wild, the Wild World of Sports that gives us another way of seeing the agony of Gethsemane and the victory of Calvary. Thank you for your sure hope of life everlasting that we have in Christ Jesus. In his matchless name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning uh, for our uh, Sunday morning worship experience. We pray that your soul will be blessed and that God will, uh, the Holy Spirit will call to your remembrance what I've shared at the appropriate time. Don't forget to mask up, uh, practice social distancing, and uh uh, wash your hands at least for 20 seconds uh, often. Be careful. It's easy to, to, to make mistakes. And mistakes with this coronavirus time could mean somebody else's death or your death. So please be careful. Take care. Bye-bye.